Welcome to Satsang. Yes. What's the best practice to quiet my mind when I become aware that I'm overthinking anything? Stop thinking. <laughs> I can talk about what I used to do. When I was a teenager and I was, my mind wouldn't stop because I was upset about something, I'd jump in my car and I'd drive at high speed to Geraldton, which is 400 kilometres away at night time by myself. And I found that in driving at reasonably high speed at night time, my mind quietened down after a while because it had to be with the road. It had to be with the, the driving. It couldn't be dreaming. And of course, all thinking is dreaming. And so that's how I used to do it when I was a teenager. I found that there are other methods that work just as well and you don't have to risk your life. The problem with driving to Geraldton at high speed is there was kangaroos and goats and all sorts of things that could be on the road and you could kill them or hurt them and damage your car or roll over. It wasn't a good idea. I found that dancing helped. If I put myself into dancing, and I'm not talking about gentle, soft dancing, I'm talking about quite aggressive dancing. If I put my awareness into my body when I was dancing, eventually my mind would quieten down and stop. Just trying to talk the mind into being quiet doesn't work. If it's agitated over something, it'll probably remain agitated. If you're a practiced meditator where well, you can put awareness on your breath, and quieten your mind that way. For a long time I just used breathing out. On the outward breath I just let everything go. That worked to some degree but that's a coping mechanism. Uh, some people say it's not possible to stop your thoughts so don't even bother trying to stop them. What would you say to them? They should put an acephalograph on my head and find out where my thoughts went because my mind is silent most of the time. And so that's just rubbish. They just don't have the ability to do it, that's all. And so because they don't have the ability to do it, they don't think anyone else does either. It's just rubbish. So is finding a distraction a good way to stop thinking at all? Developing a mind that accepts life as it is stops thinking. A lot of the thinking we do is because we're not in acceptance of things as they are. We're concerned about how things are going to turn out. Turn out. We get caught in tension. When you learn to accept life as it is, the mind can relax and it can stay relaxed because if we have a problem, and we're totally accepting, accepting of the problem, the thoughts stop. Total acceptance is the end of th thinking. It's brilliant. I love it. But it takes quite a lot of practice to get good at accepting life as it is because it's not something we're taught at school. We were taught to problem solve. We're taught to resist. We're taught to contract. We're taught to do all sorts of things that make us quite unhappy. Acceptance wasn't one of the things we were taught at school, yet it is the answer to having a happy life. If we can accept life as it is, we can be happy. We can stop suffering. But if we can't accept life as it is, we will continue to resist what we don't like and we'll suffer accordingly, because resistance equals suffering. So it depends on how much acceptance you can put on any single thing as to how much you suffer. Your choice. You create your reality with the way you think. No one's doing it to you. You're doing it to yourself.
What about negative thoughts? Do you recommend reframing negative thought patterns? <laughs> I just don't entertain them. It's pretty simple. Negative thinking actually sinks you. People who are negative thinkers sink themselves constantly. Human beings are naturally buoyant, but the moment we start getting negative about things, we sink ourselves. I'm not suggesting that you need to be positive. Just don't be negative. Don't entertain negativity. Because if you do, it will sink you. It's like you take yourself down a dark alley and you mug yourself. For what? It doesn't change anything. What do you think about the practice of writing down thoughts that you become aware arise? Do you think that can be helpful? What I did was I started writing down beliefs that I had that when the, when the belief somehow didn't have the expectation on it met, I'd go into contraction and go into resistance to life. I started writing down my beliefs and then I started undoing them all. And you undo a belief very simply. You just put doubt in it. The more doubt you can put into a belief, the less integrity it can have. And so I started undoing my belief systems when I was about 19 years old. Undid the limiting belief systems. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any statements or any challenges to anything that's been said here this evening? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like my, I have a fear of failure. No, the thing that causes you to fail the most is your arrogance. When you don't know something, you don't ask someone, you try to do it yourself without any expertise. I got over failure big time because I did an apprenticeship in mechanics. And if you failed in, at what you were doing and you hadn't asked the guy that was training you which way to go, you'd get a clip around the ears. And so, so I've developed a pattern in my life of if I don't know what I'm doing, I get someone else who does know to help me. To try to do it yourself when you don't really know is just arrogance. That's the cause of failure. If you don't know, ask someone. Ask someone who does know. It's best. Anything else? Yeah, I feel like I'm struggling to accept the fact that I don't know a lot of things. Like Why should you know a lot of things? You're quite young. Yeah. There's heaps of things you haven't done. You know? If you haven't been trained in doing something, why should you know how to do it? Yeah, there's, there's no reason. No. no. Earlier. Uh, yeah. Something about arrogance. About arrogance, yeah. Mm. Yeah, in the game of higher consciousness, uh, you always be a beginner. How can you be a beginner if you're arrogant? That's impossible. You can't have a beginner's mind if you're arrogant. What you do have, though, you have a failure's mind. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's coming really, really clear. Mm. That, that Anything else? I'm so grateful. You are very welcome. Thank you. Yes. Hello, Vishwan. Um, a lot of people would take offence to being called arrogant. What does it take um, to be able to to accept 
that kind of teaching that you just gave? You have to be a mature adult. Immature adults will take offence. You have to take responsibility for yourself and what you're like. If you go into contraction and take offence to anything, basically you're not taking responsibility for your own feelings, which is immaturity. The game of higher consciousness is for adults. Immature adults don't make it. You have to be a mature adult. Abay, hello. Hello. Um, Bhagwan, today I um, I felt um, that you know I, I'm seeking love outside from people and material. So uh, now I want to find love within myself. Where do I start? You start with practicing openness because the only reason people can't perceive love, because love is always here, is because they're closed or defended. Usually both. Closed and defended doesn't allow you to perceive love. It filters it, it blocks it. People who perceive love, perceive love in openness. And the more open you can be, the better. So that's where you begin, with the practice of openness. Anything else a day? That's all, Baba. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Rajesh. Hi, Bhagwan. Hello. Um, today, I noticed that um, a lot of times I'm thinking about problems that are not really problems and then um, dismissing them by saying it doesn't matter. Um, can this thought of it doesn't matter, even if it's directed to negative thoughts, can it contribute to me being apathetic? What I discovered was that I had been trained at school to be a problem solver like everybody else. And I got to realise that in being trained to be a problem solver, I was living in my head solving problems all the time. Which is not living in reality, it's living in a matrix in your mind. And my preference was to living in reality. Uh, nothing you think is real, it's just dream. And so I saw the solving problems in my head all the time as the problem, and I stopped it. Consciously and stopped it. Stopped. Just stopped it, or said a word to stop it, or thought something? No, the mind runs true to its default patterning. What's your default patterning? Most people's default patterning is to be problem solving because that's what they learned at school for 12 years and then maybe university for another five, six years or whatever. Um, I just saw the light. It was really simple. I don't want to live in my head for the rest of my life solving problems because it, to me, seemed like a form of suffering in itself. And so I just stopped solving problems. I didn't use a word, I didn't use anything else, I just stopped solving problems. I saw the point. The problem that the thought about problems would arise, I just not entertain it. I wasn't interested in entertaining uh, something that was going to create a discomfort for myself. And if you think problem solving doesn't cause discomfort, you simply haven't had a look yet. Okay. Is there anything else? Uh, no, that was it. Thank you. Yes. Um, but when 
scientists uh, sometimes say that mind is like a muscle and you should exercise doing different like exercises like sudoku or some creativity or something to keep uh, so that otherwise you will have alzheimer or dementia later All do right. you agree with that well if you're in life with people, you are exercising it, are you not? Now, if you're sitting in a monastery somewhere, watching your belly button get bigger, <laughs> there's a good chance, there's a good chance that it might atrophy. But when you're in life and you've got a husband to take care of, in your case, and probably a whole pile of other things, how aren't you using your mind? not like something it is just like normal job it is not like creativity or something that you we are exercising some yeah so you are just doing all the things that you have already done many times uh -huh. I don't know that's why I was asking someone asked me this question well, I'm not talking to someone who sits in a monastery or an ashram or a cave, just you know, doing nothing. I'm talking to someone who's out in the marketplace. So, of course, you're using your mind. As a matter of fact, I don't teach people who live in monasteries or ashrams or caves. I keep away from them. I'm interested in helping people who are in the marketplace, who have families, who have jobs. I'm interested in helping them raise their consciousness level so they can get free. Anything else? Okay. Rajesh, had we finished chatting, had we? Okay. Prem Abbey, hello. Hello, Vishram. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Abby. Um, sometimes you talk about uh, inside and outside, or you says that you're going in. Um, but is there really a difference? Yeah, there is. I've answered your question. Can you explain the difference? Now that's a different question, isn't it? It is. <laughs> mm. So some people think going in is actually going into the mind and examining it. That's not what I mean by going in. What I mean by going in is uh, turning awareness onto itself. That that's aware of the mind can be turned onto itself. That is going in. That has nothing to do with the mind. It's actually beyond the mind. The mind can be used as a tool to help turn awareness onto itself, but it's about going beyond the mind, not inside the mind. Anything inside the mind, as far as I'm concerned, is still outside. So when you turn awareness to itself, you're still aware about everything that's going on? Can be. You, you can be. You can be aware of uh, what's awareness can be aware of itself, and you can be aware out here. Awareness doesn't have to be in one spot. It can be in one spot, but it can be in and out. And I like to refer to that as one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. Because I, I listened to someone to, who said that at some point, uh, in and out collapses, and then, then it's just what is. Yeah, that's a, a head trip. There's a huge difference between in and out. If I turn my awareness all the way in, this world disappears completely. And I am just the vast universe without any reference points that cannot be compared in any way to having awareness out. Whether the out is on your mind and what you think or out here with what you see and hear and smell and touch. The difference is absolutely huge. <laughs> and still you experience it like you are everything of that 
or I guess when you turn it in, there's no there's no U there, or maybe not anyway. There's no U here when I'm out here either. The U disappeared 24 years ago. The, the I disappeared. It's not here. Yeah. So awareness is currently out here with you and the people in this room and the people on the screen, but it's also on itself. And so the experience of that is being everything at once and also being out here. Hmm. Anything else? I'm having a problem now. I want to find a teacher for the festival, but uh, since I met you, the bar is so high, I can't find anyone who want to come to the festival. <laughs> oh, you want a teacher that teaches Tantra? No, I want a non-duality teacher. The Tantra is just to, it's like Osho, you know, you trick the people to come there and then you have a, someone who's the real deal. <laughs> Tricking people to come to a concert and then taking money off them, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they get some Tantra as well, you know. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, I was going to say thank you. Yeah. You're looking for a spiritual teacher, someone who's awake. Yeah, it's they're all in America, you know. It's a lot of them in America. There might be. I don't know. Maybe there is. I don't know. There's an awful lot of um, people out there who think they're awake, but they're not. Yeah. Because the bar had been set so low by some spiritual teachers that people thought just as having a satori and remembering uh, the satori was enlightenment but that's just not the case yeah. it's it's having awareness on awareness continually 24 hours a day you wake someone up in the middle of the night who's who's actually enlightened and this they still have their awareness on awareness doesn't go away because they go to sleep. <laughs> Their mind goes to sleep, that is. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. You can always drop the uh, festival and come over to Australia and hang out, mate. <laughs> I'm working on it, you know. I'm working on it. <laughs> Changed a lot of stuff since I started to, to see you. So. Yeah. Less with the festival, yeah. Yeah. Well, best of luck. Thank you. Hey, Zoba. Hi, Vishant. Hello. I wanted to ask you um, some. Sometimes you talk about the 12 cylinders that you got and you choose to run on one. I wanted to ask you, do, is there any point in your day-to-day -day life that you go more than that? Or is it always... Yeah, sometimes I run on eight when I get into my V8 Mustang and put my foot down flat to the floor. There's 450 horsepower. Yeah. Screaming that that motor screams, man. She gets up there so quick. Yeah, eight cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I can I can go from one cylinder. I can go from zero cylinders to twelve cylinders in less than a second and back again. You must have heard me roar from time to time. Anything else, Silver? I think he's frozen. What was that? So yeah, I think my, my connection is a bit dodgy. Uh, oh. I've seen you on retreat, on retreat uh, giving fire. Mm. And uh, is, that, is that you using the cylinders there? 
It might be, I don't know. Yeah, we'd have to pick, pick a particular time. Uh, yeah. as a, as a, when I saw it, it, it felt like you were, you know, you, you were giving fire properly. Yeah. No yeah. point being half-hearted about things, is there? Totality rules. But the thing about uh, going to, you know, 12 cylinders, uh, as soon as it's as soon as it stops, it's back to one or zero. Because I live there, I live in that uh, silence and stillness of nothingness. It's very nice. I watch other I watch uh, humans suffer incredibly because they're constantly living in their heads, desiring things to be different than how they are, getting attached to what they think they have and getting frightened of losing it. What a terrible way to live. And so I try to talk people out of it. <laughs> you know. What about accepting life as it is? It's really nice to do that. And if you practice it, you get good at it. But people don't tend to practice it. They practice resistance. They practice uh, contracting. And so they get really good at suffering. Yes, even as I practice, uh, you know, when I, when things kind of, uh, when I'm under pressure, I still get, you know, caught and still, even with all the practice, I still get, and that's part, I understand that's part of the practice as well. So it's like, it's well, that just means you haven't practiced enough. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Anything that catches you or anyone that catches you is actually your teacher. They're showing you where you haven't, uh, let go inside where you haven't undone whatever belief systems uh, you got caught on. And so the world is full of teachers. If you want the world to be full of teachers, all you've got to do is look where you contract. Look where you go into resistance. And instead of continuing to go into resistance, undo it all. Undo whatever belief systems are involved. I wanted to ask you about belief systems as well. Uh, you know, there's some obvious ones. Uh, you speak about them quite often about fairness and not being, shouldn't be betrayed, shouldn't be lied to. Uh, you know, the kind of obvious ones. And uh, there's more that are kind of subtle and uh, less easy to spot. Could you give me some examples, or maybe one or two examples of more subtle belief systems? Not really. Just remove the gross ones first and then see what's left. That's the process. Re re get rid of the gross belief systems that cause contraction in you and then see what's next. And as you release the, the gross ones, you'll find more subtle ones. That's the way to go. Giving you a, a subtle belief system to, uh, for you to work on is just you trying to get my attention. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yeah, one last question, Richard. Uh, back to the cylinder thing. Uh, when you dance, do you use more yeah. cylinders? Do you use more? Okay. Sometimes I, I just use one cylinder and sometimes I use 12. And if I use 12, I have to have um, aspirin before and after. <laughs> 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 um, because I, I am a very aggressive dancer. I love to dance really totally and I throw myself into it. And my body is telling me that it doesn't like it. And unfortunately, I'm not listening. <laughs> I believe you've got to squeeze the juice out of life. You know, we, only, we have this life, we might as well really enjoy it. And so totality and whatever we do is the best way to approach anything because it usually guarantees success. So I'm successfully getting back aches. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to go out and dance to um, bands like ACDC and uh, they're so good. Get down, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree, I agree. Very good. Mm.
Lots of energy coming out, yes. Yeah. Lots of energy, lots of high frequency. Mm. Rock and roll. Rock and roll, yes, sir. Thank Anything you, Michelle. Else? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I love you. Thank you so much. I love you too, Zorba. Thank you, I love you. Good day. Hi, Vishran. How do you say your second name? Is it Davigan? Uh, Dave Gunn. Dave Gunn. What sort of gun are you, Dave? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe a Top Gun? <laughs> well, the first part of Dave means God. So. <laughs> uh, you reckon Dave means God? God, there's an awful lot of Daves in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Dave uh, came it was a short abbreviation of David, which is an old biblical name. In Hindi, Dave means God. In what Hindi? Hindi. Dave means God, does it really? Ah, there you go. So you're God's gun. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty powerful stuff, mate. <laughs> What does gun mean in Hindi? Uh, gun means quality. So we're talking quality God. <laughs> not, not just ordinary God, but quality God. Wow, that's a pretty impressive name, Jay. Uh, it's more like a God-like qualities, God's qualities. So ah, God's qualities. Ah, like being omnipresent or omnipresent. Uh, yeah, or just good qualities, you know, living a good life, moral life. Right. But that's not godly. Mm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> omnipresent, omnipowerful, all that good stuff. Okay, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still like. I still like. It's just God's gun. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what would you like to talk about, Jay? Uh, so it was great meeting you, and uh, I have been applying your uh, advice of being enthusiastic, and it is working really well. But sometimes it feels natural. Sometimes it does not feel natural. It feels very forced. What should I do? Right, I do? mate. What would God's gun do? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be get your motor running yeah. out on the highways looking for adventure or anything that comes my way? Born to be wild. Hey, God's gun, give it, give it your totality. Ha ha ha. I think human beings are naturally buoyant, as I was saying earlier, and the only thing that really takes us down is, is negativity. And so if you remove negativity, you can truly be God's gun. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, when I'm at work, some of my when I talk to my colleagues, chat with them, some of them are just uh, complaining or, and are giving out this stressful energy. So, how do you deal with such people you run into in your life? Uh, yeah, I I usually divert their attention to something else because I'm not interested in listening to whining whinges. It's just been my it because. Uh, it doesn't do anyone any favours, it doesn't do them any favours, and it doesn't do you a favour, and so I divert their attention to something else. Like, gosh, isn't that wall white? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything will do. Why would you want to entertain... Because we're talking usually victim-orientated stories, people who aren't happy with their life and turn themselves into a victim of it, and what they're doing is trying to share their misery with you. 
Uh, I'm not interested. The wall looks interesting. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, that's it. Thanks a lot, Vishran. You'd be surprised at how many of these people who are negative uh, disappear out of your life when you start telling the truth. Truth. Yeah, the truth. Tell them, tell them what they're really doing. See what happens. Uh, that, <laughs> that creates fireworks. <laughs> yeah. Then you'll real, really, truly be God's gun. <laughs> Maybe they'll make a movie about you one day. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, your teaching is about stopping the mind, and many teachers teach about manifestation and, and engaging in the mind. Uh, is a way of manifesting just creating desires inside your mind and leaving you uh, more lost? Manifesting is just still locked in lower consciousness, still dreaming. Higher consciousness is not about dreaming, it's about being present to reality. You can train the mind to manifest, but that's still lower consciousness. My whole thing is higher consciousness because that's where we can get free. No matter how good you are at manifesting, you're going to be locked in lower consciousness with it. It doesn't raise your consciousness levels. Yeah, my experience is that when you get what you want, you, because you train the mind to be always looking for something, you just chase the next thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah you get one thing and then you want another thing because that's the nature of the mind, to constantly want things to be different than how they are. Now, if you practice acceptance, your mind shuts up after a while. When you start seeing life as just as it is, rather than right and wrong, good and bad, the mind shuts up, it's got nothing to talk about. And then you can just be, and being is so beautiful. Being uh, a somebody that's thinking, that has a past and a future, that's nowhere near as beautiful as just being. Then you have Heaven is when you find heart. You know, I see heart as, and love as heaven. And most people keep themselves away from heaven because they're too closed, they're too defended. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Hello. Is manifesting more effective if you have a quiet mind? I do my best to not manifest. Sometimes I can't help it. But I don't teach people how to manifest because it just creates greed and greed is another form of suffering. What about developing a mind that is happy with what is through the practice of acceptance? And then whether you're wealthy or you're poor, you're still happy. But if you can't accept life as it is, no matter how wealthy you are, you're not going to be happy. And no matter how poor you are, you're not going to be happy. Acceptance is the key. And that's not about manifesting, it's about practicing acceptance. Okay? I felt really happy today and I was, I was looking in, in myself, and it was it was definitely a result of not thinking. Okay. So I certainly had that. Is easy. I'm, I'm just sure that's the way. Yeah. Yeah, not thinking is brilliant. Just being present to reality is brilliant. But it's not what we were programmed to do. We were programmed to live in our minds and suffer until we die. That's what we were programmed to do. Horrible. Anything else? Okay. Abaya, hello. Hello, Vishran. Hello. Um, 
Yes, sir, Bayer. Yeah, um, You feeling good, Abaya? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're having trouble finding words. Yeah. No. <laughs> no I, <don't. laughs> I used to love that about being with my teachers, sitting there and talking to them and suddenly losing my mind and going, wow, man, this is so good. I kind of, I, I became a bit of a satsang junkie, you know. But at some point I worked out that uh, I needed to find the space for myself, not rely on an awake teacher to find the space. And so I started following the instructions of my teacher. Yeah. I watch so many thousands and thousands and thousands of sannyasins miss, miss Osho because they'd go to satsang, get stoned on his energy and not do what he was teaching. And he was teaching meditation, self-inquiry, openness, the way of the heart. His teachings were all there but people weren't practicing and so they didn't get very far, they just became junkies for satsang. I hope you don't become a junkie for satsang because you look pretty stoned. <laughs> Sorry for keeping you awake, Mahan. <laughs> People forget that I can see them on the screen, don't they? <laughs> um, yeah. I th you had enough yet? Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> always, always lovely to see you, Abaya. Yeah, same. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often, people think they can get rid of me by saying thank you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Amber. <laughs> Hello, Amber. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a collateral damage, I think. My God, what did you say? What was that? Oh, collateral damage, right. Uh, I, I really liked what you said about uh, acceptance and that ac in acceptance, the mind, the mind has nothing to say. Well, that's what I found. Yeah, I found that to be true. If I had a problem and I was in total acceptance of it, it everything shut up. But if I wasn't in total acceptance of it, the story continued. So one of the ways that I realized when I was in total acceptance of anything is the story ended. Whatever the story might have been. Wow, you just disappeared. You went kind of alien then. I realized today if I don't find a way to quiet, quiet in my mind, I will just sink and sink and sink until the day I die. Well, most human beings do. They think and 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 think until they die. Yes. Yes. That's pretty common. Being able to be in this moment without a thought is very lovely. Yeah. It's meditation. That's what meditation is. Sometimes it doesn't feel like 
resistance. It's just like um, chit chat. Yeah, that's because you've become very accustomed to it. Yeah, to you it's just the way it is. So for you, every single thought is resistance? Well, I don't do that. I don't. I, I live mostly in silence and stillness. I don't have an interest in thinking unless I absolutely have to. You know, it's nice just to be. So to, to stop the chit chat, that's not like heavily resisting. Um, it's just meditation and practice. Well, meditation just means um, putting awareness on that that's real and everything is real except what you think. Yeah. Ultimately, the best meditation is putting awareness on awareness and then you know yourself as the universe without yourself. <laughs> the ego has a lot of trouble understanding that. It doesn't make it to enlightenment because it was never real in the first place. It was a figment of your imagination. Anything else, Amber? Um, I've been experiencing lots of grief the last few days. Um, uh. I cannot put um, any story whatsoever to it. And I was wondering uh. if... That yeah. Uh, can I be feeling the grief of some mem some family members, even if I don't live with them, even if they're not around? Is that possible? I don't know. I'm not there. We can pick up all sorts of things from other people and feel it. It's what we all have the capacity to do that to some degree. Everybody shares, well, everybody shares their presence, whatever they're carrying. And so if you're a really happy person, you share the happy energy. If you're a really a loving person who has a lot of love, you share love. If you're a real miserable person, you share miserable energy. If you're a real angry person, you share angry energy. If you're a real sad person, you share sad energy. We all share our energies. It's our presence that is our gift to everybody we meet. Yeah. Anything else? So what, about, what about people who I'm connected to but I'm not um, with them physically? What was that? I didn't understand you. What about uh, the energy of people that I'm connected with, but I'm not living with them. I'm not in their physical presence. Can, if we are connected. <clears throat> yeah, I understand. You're talking about channeling energy from people who aren't necessarily anywhere near you. Yes. Yeah, I think that's quite possible. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Hello. How do we share our presence without necessarily sharing some of the negative energy that we might be feeling? You share whatever you're carrying. You can't stop that. Whatever you're carrying, you will share with whoever you meet. And energy tends to flow from full to empty. So if you're relatively empty, you'll take on more than, you'll, that, than the other person. So what does it mean to share your presence or is it intertwined like you were just saying? Well, I share my presence by lighting everyone up that I meet. And so if I'm in a negative state when I'm sharing my presence? Yeah, that's what you'll be sharing, negativity. Yeah, you'll be sharing uh, the energy that goes with negativity. Yeah. Human beings uh, can share the ups and the downs. So do you think that when we're in a negative state, we should limit our exposure to people? Yeah, I don't think that. I just eliminated negativity from my life from about the age of 19. I couldn't, 
I could see that in my own family, um, my mother was a very negative human being and as a result she suffered incredibly and I just didn't want to follow in her footsteps. So I started eliminating negativity by eliminating worry, procrastination and victim oriented thinking of any kind. And as a result, I had a very buoyant life. <laughs> Do you like that? <laughs> Mahan, you got your little yellow hand up. Hello, Vishwan. Hello. Are there some questions from online viewers? Oh, there. <clears throat> uh, Suzanne asks, uh, Hi, Vishwan. You said once that dreams are unresolved issues from the day before. I have Satori's in my dreams from time to time. What's that about? I have no idea. I'm not about to enter your dreams. That would be really, really rude. <laughs> and if you're dreaming, I don't think it's possible to actually have a Satori because Satori's are awareness aware of itself and dreams are quite often related to memory, which is not real. It's just another dream. So you might have memories of Satori's in your dream. It's highly unlikely you're having Satori's. But you might be, I don't know. Doesn't matter either way. A Satori is only an invitation to come home. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a taste of what's real. It's a taste of your own true nature. Then it's up to you to facilitate what could possibly happen by developing a mind that can surrender. Up to you. Anything else, Mahan? Uh, yes. Andre asks, um, Vishra, every time I listen to you talk, I feel a sensation of joy at my navel. I guess it is a common feeling for people who listen to you. Could you shed some light on what, what this is, please? I don't really know. Uh, in me is a great deal of joy. I can feel it. It's in me. It's like so lovely, so lovely. It's like heaven. And I'm pretty sure that's being transmitted. But how it affects you, I don't know. Some people cry. <laughs> Other people laugh. Some people it doesn't do much too. Other people lose their minds completely. Awareness on awareness creates a very beautiful energy field. And when heart is being perceived, that produces a beautiful energy field as well. Anything else, Mahan? Uh, yes. Uh, Dana asks, uh, my father is in Tamas and I feel it. How to separate from that channel with close people? Say the question again, please. My father is in Tamas and I can feel it. How to separate from that channel with close people? Yeah, it's very difficult. I can only talk about what I did, I, you know, and I don't know if it will suit you. I've been taking tamas and rajas off people since I can remember, since I've been a little boy, because I've always been relatively empty. And so what I do with the people around me who carry tamas and rajas is I clear them by absorbing their energy. 
And I've been doing that now, gosh, for 50 odd years. And so the people around me have always felt a little bit up by being around me because I've been relieving them of their density. And the lighter you, weight you are, the more sattvic you are, that's actually what happens. You start clearing people of their density and they feel better for being around you and you feel worse for being around them. But if you're, if you're a sattvic type of person, you won't be producing this, that type of energy and it won't stay in you for very long. I used to like to have jump in the ocean or the river or have a cold shower or dance. I used to clear a fair bit because I love the pristineness and the clarity of sattvic. It's so cool. Anything else, Mahan? Uh, Dana also asks, uh, Dear Bhagwan, uh, can you bless me to come to Australia? I wish to see you once before you leave, you leave your body. I don't plan on leaving, but it's nice of you to say that. <laughs> My understanding is this, that when you get to talk, even indirectly to someone who's awake, you are already blessed, my dear. It was when I actually felt that for the first time was when I actually got to directly speak to my spiritual master, Osho. And in that transmission, my whole life was changed. The blessing had been given. You are blessed. Um, Marcus asks, would you agree that it's more challenging to be present when you're broke with a wife and baby? Ha! <laughs> what makes you think I haven't been broke with a wife or two and a baby? I, when I gave up my companies, I was poor for years. Years and years and years and years. But I didn't mind being poor because I was relatively happy because I wasn't a negative thinker and I was in acceptance of life. Happiness is related to acceptance, not wealth. Someone who's uh, poor and in acceptance of life can be very, very happy. Someone who's wealthy and not in acceptance of life can be very, very miserable. And so happiness, from my perspective, is related to how much acceptance you're offering life or how much resistance you're offering life. And that's something you're in charge of. Nobody else does that to you. And so in the years after I gave my companies away and I became very, very poor, and I mean dirt poor, I had a pretty good life because I accepted my position. I accepted my life as it was. Acceptance is the key to happiness. And it's up to you. Only you can supply the acceptance. No one can do it for you. And if you have a pattern of not accepting life, of resisting life, change it. Don't keep it, change it. Practice acceptance. Every time something comes along that you go into resistance to, find a way to accept what is. Undone, undo any belief system that supports the contractions and the resistance. Make yourself free. People who get free do it themselves. Nobody else can make you free but you. You're the one that has to do the work on you. Nobody else can do it for you. If I could do the work for people to set them free, I would do it because I love people, but I can't. All I can do is talk people into doing it themselves. Up to you. Thank you for that saying. Good to see you brave hearts here tonight.